Greetings, everyone, as we start on time for this topic of a lost decade question mark. Are we going to lose it or not? Uh, I've said to our panellists that maybe we've got one of the more depressing topics, but the whole idea of WEF is to look for solutions and find ways through the times we live in. And they're not just interesting times, they're in many respects very shocking times, so it requires even more of a, a step up than we might uh, ever have imagined at, at, at this uh, point in, in human history. You turn on the news every day, you think, am I living in this dystopia <laughs> which we've created as, as, as human beings? This is, this is not, not good. We've seen our planet brought to the edge of its boundaries and beyond in, in some cases. We walked into a global pandemic because we weren't uh, ready and we were slow to respond. And then in the past three months, we have just seen this horrible, horrible tragedy unfold with the war in Ukraine. Uh, tragic for Ukrainians, first and foremost, but with spillover impacts uh, globally. Uh, there's been a lot of talk here at Davos of the, the food and energy price spikes and what this is going to do to the, the poorest uh, around our world. Of course, the huge numbers of forcibly displaced uh, people over the borders of Ukraine. We're now seeing some of you know, really the best of the traditional donors uh, diverting money out of their development budgets uh, to settle uh, refugees in their countries. That, that's less money for humanitarian support and the other things that these budgets uh, cover. And then we worry about uh, the shadow that, that this toxic geopolitics now will cast over our capacity to, to solve these big uh, shared challenges uh, of climate and the threats to biodiversity and ongoing poverty and, and hunger, uh, and, 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 and. So, none of this is the way we would want the world to be. So the big question is, what can we do about it? Can we course correct, if so, and over what time frame? And I've got a wonderful panel that's going to help us answer these questions. I have uh, uh, Kirill Petkov, the Prime Minister of Bulgaria. I have uh, Hina Rabani Kar, who is Minister of State for Foreign Affairs from Pakistan. And I have Carolyn Anstey, President and CEO of PACT USA, which is an international development organization, works in close to 40 countries uh, looking for human development uh, solutions. Remember, we're being live streamed. We're happy for you to tweet your heart's desires with hashtag WEF20. Two. So, let me come to Prime Minister uh, Petkov. In these troubled times, share with us a, just a bit about the realities your country's been facing. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually focus on the specifics of, of the Ukrainian war and the European situation, what we have done as a mistake in the last decade, as the last decade, and I hope in the second uh, part of the debate to, to, and discussion to tell you what I think we could do and use this as a this problem as an opportunity. So it should not be a depressing discussion. It should be, as you said, very clearly find find the path forward. So in 2014, we were obviously we all saw the taking over of Crimea, and we thought, oh, that's very negative. We had a lot of political criticism towards Putin, but at the same time, we didn't do our serious homework of strategic next steps that could have made it very different today if we had done them. First of all, we allowed for a lot of the gas storages of Europe yeah. to be owned by Gazprom, uh, which creates incredible dependency. Instead of thinking of how to decrease the dependency, we built um, Turkey Stream, which is uh, one of the big pipes uh, going through Turkey into Europe, again, Gazprom gas, and we also built uh, North Stream, which now it was almost about to be turned on before German sa Germany said no, which also increased the, the dependency. We tied our electrical prices with our gas prices, that, which meant that Russia could not only dec decrease the supply of gas, but can regulate our electrical prices throughout Europe. We allowed uh, our embassies to be filled with agents. A little Bulgaria, for example, we have 118 diplomats in the embassy of Sofia that are Russian, and uh, Greece is very similar number next to us, and Romania as well. Uh, we, so we kind of opened the door for hybrid attacks. We also um, didn't think strategically about our 
defense strategy and we didn't think about the eastern flank, the logistics. We don't really have corridors south, north to move troops, uh, goods along the, the eastern flank. So we kind of were criticizing politically. We did all the political discussion, yet our dependency increased. Our strategic thinking was not there. And now, uh, last year, as the, the gas supply was decreased, the gas storages were uh, turned down from Russia, we all felt all of a sudden we're in the midst of crisis just before the war started, a war that we could not respond as much as we would like because of these dependencies. Mm. So this is the current situation, and there are clear answers what we can do forward, and I really hope that in another decade we'll not have this discussion, but the next discussion will be what lessons did we learn the first time that made us much more stable, much stronger, much less dependent, both for dependency to Russia, but also, as you said, for the health of the planet. Yeah. So, a lot of lessons not learned, which you're now very quickly <laughs> learning and, and moving forward, and we'll, we'll come back to, to that. Uh, Minister Hina from, from Pakistan, the realities for your country at mm -hmm. the moment. Okay, so interestingly, I noticed that you did not mention a very big reality, which has a very big impact on my country in your uh, what has gone wrong in the world, and that is Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, and I mentioned this specifically because this is what does. A new crisis comes up, and a crisis that we leave behind gets yeah. left behind. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, whether it's a humanitarian disaster, and people are dying, and UNDP tells us that 97% of the people are going to be below poverty line, it doesn't matter to the world because the world is looking somewhere else. Now, the problem with such a framework or you know, happening is that the impact on the people, which is in this case 40 million of ones, mm. is not undone when the world starts to look away. The impact on them continues to happen, mm. right? And then the impact on countries like ours, who are, have a 2,600 kilometer border with them, also continues to happen. Mm -hmm. And as we have said repeatedly, uh, and I would like to say this again, because many a times Pakistan finds itself in a very difficult position. Mm. We find ourselves in a position where we are, it seems, the expectation of the West, of the international community is superimposed on us at the same time as the expectation of what is now the interim Afghan government is also superimposed on us. And Pakistan finds itself carrying, at the same time, two briefs and not having the ability to articulate and put forward what is its own brief, what it is its own policy. So I would perhaps want to take a minute to be able to do that because we feel very strongly that as a country which has constitutional provisions for women to be part of normal, equal, equally part of the Pakistani society, the Pakistani classrooms, the Pakistani parliament, the Pakistani banks, the Pakistani workspace. We find it obviously distressful that our sisters and women across the border will be curtailed in, the, in ways that they are, right? And we find it just more than distressful that some of that thought process may permeate through the border and find its space, which is obviously a threat. Mm. I consider that to be a threat for Pakistan. Now, having said that, because of that grandstanding moral position that a lot of the international community also has and shares with Pakistan, perhaps, shall we enable the complete implosion of the Afghan economy mm. and also the starvation of the Afghan people so that we can hold our moral, mm. moral position? I find that to be equally threatening mm -hmm. to us. So Pakistan feels threatened in some ways, and being in the space which we didn't want to own, which we don't choose for ourselves. Um, so just wanting to put, put it on over here, because I look at Ukraine being no, nowhere similar, but when the tension of the world comes, it also goes away very quickly. But right now, when we talk about negotiation as an option in Ukraine, and a lot of people say, no, not until this happens, the people who are suffering, the collateral damage that is happening is not about mm. countries who are summoning, perhaps, but of the Ukrainian people, just as in Afghanistan, of the Afghan people, and then some of the spillover mm. of the Pakistani people also. So I think, uh, in some ways, I find it, I want to be optimistic, mm. but in the way we have seen interventions play out in the last two decades, I'm quite pessimistic mm -hmm. about how we leave the leftovers and the repercussions and the ramifications and start looking for the new you know, place where to put all our minds to and then perhaps we, and while all of this is happening on the international stage, 
both humanity and the planet is being threatened or like never before. Mm. Two things that I, and I often say that every time Time magazine would have a cover story on uh, the next pandemic coming, I would turn it around and say, no, not my problem. And it became our problem. It became a common problem, right? And much as the pandemic also gave us some hope because I think we were very good with being able to come up with vaccines quite quickly, it also taught, taught us a lesson that if we only try to preserve our, ourselves, as in me, if self-preservation and not the others, not preserving others will come back to harm you. Mm -hmm. uh, because when vaccines were not judiciously distributed, uh, the pandemic found its way to, the, the virus found its way to mutate into various forms and then we all had to suffer because of those choices that were made. And at the same time, so that, that's on humanity and then I'll add on to that, in some ways, uh, obviously exacerbated by the conflict in Ukraine, but the food security crisis, okay? So 20 years from today, we were looking at a food security challenge and today we are looking at a food security crisis. So have we gained or have we lost? And I find it difficult to live with a situation where we have actually lost more than we have gained. Then in the very same way as the pandemic is something that you would go like, you know, not my problem. Climate change, not my problem. Well, what, guess what? It is all of our problems, okay? Because now the climate, uh, you know, if Pakistan had one of its hottest uh, months in, in years, perhaps the hottest in our history. Uh, Bangladesh is currently suffering from a very bad flood. We've had flash floods. So climate change is now saying to us, I'm not a problem that you have to deal in the, with in the future, I'm a problem that you've already made, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in order to deal with all of those global challenges, we had this thing called in 2015, two big ticket items where, where, where the, I think 2015 was still the time where the world was working together to mm -hmm. deal with the challenges rather than create more challenges. And in that uh, framework, we had the SDGs and we had the climate, Paris Climate Agreement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I had to be reminded by my colleagues that there was a commitment made of about $100 billion to enable developing countries to deal with the climate uh, change requirements, processes, systems. I don't even want to look at the number in terms of how much have we met. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, the long and short of it is that we have humanity and planet being challenged like perhaps not in the last many decades. Mm -hmm. And our answer to that is that the world order as it existed also does not, is also teetering away and we have no, so we, what we, uh, we, we're finding answers in tactical form uh, in some ways and creating fissures and divisions which are us versus them, which is mm -hmm. creating a world which is a dangerous world. Mm -hmm. uh, one in which we are not looking at ourselves as us but as us versus them. Mm. Well, you're right that media attention, world attention moves on very, mm. very quickly. Mm. Remember August last year, it was Afghanistan war Absolutely. and war. Absolutely. But the CNN effect says that sooner or later that story gets stale. Mm. And, uh, you know, let's be honest, once Western countries had evacuated their nationals, the story went stale. Yeah. And the Afghans were left with the mm. very dismal. Uh, consequences, and we could add to the, you know, ignoring now of Afghanistan, Myanmar, mm. things are bad. Tigray and Ethiopia, things are bad. Yemen, they're still bad. Syria, sure. you know, all the military coups in West Africa. But, you know, at the moment, Ukraine, although I feel watching media now, the media want to move on from that too. Mm. Ukraine starts to slip from the, the headlines, despite the, you know, the horror. You know, I mean, over 13 million people forcibly displaced is it, it, not a small number of people. And, and of course, you know, well over a quarter of the, the population. So it, it is distressing. Carolyn, what, what are you seeing from the PAC perspective? So, um, Helen, I think you did a great job at the beginning of outlining all the problems, food crisis, fuel crisis, fertilizer crisis for many. Um, I guess I would add another F, which is fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's so much that needs to be done and many countries are essentially bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no funds uh, to do it. I remember the last time we met here in Davos in person, mm -hmm. January 2020, walking down the promenade mm -hmm. and all the stores that are taken over by businesses, in every window you saw the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. right? You saw sustainability. Uh, I haven't heard, you're the first person in the four days that I've been here to mention the SDGs. Mm. 
So I think a lot of things are falling off the agenda, and even sustainability and climate is not as dominant as it once um, was. I would add to that um, progress on gender going backwards. Um, enormous, you talked about the schism or the them and us between countries, but it's also within countries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A lot of countries very, very divided internally, polarized. And um, across the world, the, the polls tell us there's a lack of trust mm -hmm. in institutions. Mm -hmm. So Helen, you talk about you know, how we can all come together to fix things, but there is, there is a lot of uh, lack of trust. So that's essentially the bad news of what I see, and uh, I do worry about uh, development assistance being diverted away. We already see some European budgets. <laughs> Instead of being spent um, overseas, they're all gonna be spent at home now on, on the refugee crisis. And we know in the development community, getting additionality is very, extra money is always very different, difficult. That's the bad news. What's the good news? I do see a glimmer of, um, of good news, and that is all those people here at Davos who are working on development, everybody's talking about localization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there's no trust necessarily in big institutions, in government, people are now saying problems have to be solved at the local level. Because COVID essentially had to be delivered at the local level, we've empowered local communities. And for so long, we've talked about stakeholders, we've talked about uh, beneficiaries. Now we're starting to talk about solutionaries, mm. people at the local level who will make their own solutions. Mm. And I think we've built this network now to deliver vaccines. We now have to pivot it <laughs> to deliver um, healthcare, to deliver education, mm -hmm. to empower those communities mm -hmm. uh, to hold governments accountable through stronger civil society, stronger media. So I think in that um, localization uh, emphasis, there has to be buy-in, there has to be ownership at the local level. That's what we deal at PACT, we work with local communities. That is a real hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very, very interesting. Kind of anticipates the, the next question I was going to throw to the Prime Minister, which is um, you now see the lessons that needed to be learned. So tell us about how Bulgaria is pivoting to take on these, the, the, these challenges and, and where you think that's going to lead you. Yeah, it's um, the opportunity is there. Mm. And so what happened to us, we, be, we were the most dependent, gas dependent country in Europe mm. uh, to Russia. We were over 95% dependency. And they asked us to pay in rubles. And we said no. And everybody was very surprised because we were supposed to say yes the fastest. Because when you're 95% dependent, you should be the fastest to say yes. But we said no. And not on, so we became from 95% dependent to 0% dependent over one week. The question is how can you pull this off? Uh, and this is the, the starting of the lessons, and I think we're learning it through COVID, and now we're learning it through energy. Uh, we have to act together. So we looked at this opportunity where, how can we diversify right away, and we saw that the economics, and that's interesting, because uh, helping out other countries could be not only uh, a positive thing to do for the common good, but also a very profitable venture. So in our case, if you look at the, the prices, Hendrika prices in the US are 26 euros per megawatt. Uh, the market in Europe, uh, Gazprom prices were at about 70 euros per megawatt. So you can help out a region Eastern Europe and still make over two and a half times your money. As long as you see it as an opportunity and as long as we can act together, communicate together and act fast. So over the next uh, 30 days, we were able to get alternative supply. We were able to look at into the, not only for us, that was interesting. So you were saying it very well, we cannot look only for us. We started looking at our gas infrastructure on a regional level. If we can diversify ourselves, potentially we can use the same method of LNG through Turkey and Greece to, to go for the whole Balkans. And actually what pipes used to go from Ukraine 
Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, <laughs> Turkey, uh, now we can reverse them back. How about we start pushing the gas up from Greece, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine? Why is this important? When you look at the regional level, there are synergies. Synergies that if you look in a country by country, you cannot. For example, Ukraine right, right now has over excess supply of electricity. If they can supply electricity from Ukraine to Romania, Romania doesn't have to buy as much electricity from us. We can sell this electricity to Greece, which can then change their consumption of gas because they use gas for electricity. All of a sudden, we have less use of gas, more optimal use of the system level, and using the existing infrastructure to look at it on a regional level, decreasing our dependency. Mm -hmm. The second part is when we talk about sustainability. I mean, this is the best time if you want to decrease dependency, mm -hmm. also to increase your sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud to say we're launching now a project, the biggest battery, grid battery project in Europe, uh, where we're going to put over 6,000 megawatt uh, of megawatt hours of battery storage on a grid level with a lot of uh, um, solar uh, electricity supply so that we can have a base load based on, on the sun. So all of a sudden, not because we really love to do it, but because we had to do it, but with looking at it as an opportunity, my hope is that by the end of the year, we can say we have no dependency on Russia on gas, and we have a lot more green economy mm -hmm. than before, and now the coordination between us in the region has increased because of this threat. And final example on this, when we talk about military mobility, I mean, up to now we had only one bridge between Romania and Bulgaria where we can move things along on, on the east uh, of both countries. Uh, we just came together and said, why we have one bridge? Let's have five bridges. I go to Greece and we're like, let's increase our interconnects with, with the uh, uh, gas supplies. So in other words, there is hope because when, when it really gets tough, this is when you become creative mm -hmm. and then you realize the, the gain of working together. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm actually optimistic for, for the next decade if we have taken this lesson from the last decade, which we've lost, uh, and say, OK, we don't want to lose another one. Yeah, it's refreshing because your attitude is we're not going to cry over spilt milk. We're going to get on and make our luck. And I think the energy transition possibilities coming out of this in, in, in Europe more broadly are, are really very, very exciting. Uh, just a heads up to the audience, in a couple of minutes they're going to come and say, you know, what would you like to put into the discussion? So just be thinking about what you'd, you'd like to say. Uh, Minister Hina, would you like to sort of maybe talk a little bit about what, what are the opportunities in, in Pakistan to innovate in response to the, the crises <laughs> that you're facing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think it's, 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 it's a bit more challenging to have a response to crisis, pretty much your type of situation, where the crises are not in your control, right? So the crisis on the border, for instance, is not something that we yeah. made, but it was handed over and then everybody left. We, we can't pluck ourselves up and leave, right? But then again, to try and look at it positively, I think there is a real possibility of the region working in a way that it has never worked, mm -hmm. How, okay? Which would require, so I, the only silver lining that I have seen in all of this is the potential for trade uh, of Afghanistan with its neighbors, which includes obviously Pakistan and Uzbekistan. Now, what is happening at the same time is that what, because of the, because of what the U.S. decided to do on the, their exchange, uh, in, in, on their reserves, and because of the banking channels collapsing, um, the, the Afghan economy is not able to function at all, right? So you can, even as an international organization, if you want to take funds there. So that's, I think, uh, where the world is actually enabling a disaster, uh, which it should stop enabling and should start disabling uh, immediately. Because that has an impact not only on Afghanistan, but the entire region. Um, and of course, if the impact is only on Afghanistan, that's big enough. Now, looking at where Pakistan is, Pakistan has always talked about itself being a geostrategic location, right? But a geostrategic location, which is a, a positive geostrategic location, can only be such if we start trading with all of our neighbors. Mm. Now, the problem again is that one of our neighbors decide to go rogue, which is India. Now, the bigger problem than the superimposed problem is that 
the world has, however, is currently very enamored by that neighbor because it is part of the China containment policy. So I'm just giving you an example of how a country finds itself being the victim in some ways of um, international politics, international geopolitics. Uh, and I still want to take the, the positive on what can Pakistan do to assist itself, okay? So when it comes to India, I don't think we can do much until India decides to at least stop being rogue on whether it's Indian occupied Kashmir or it's the rights of the minorities. And when it comes to Pakistan also, what Pakistan can do is to be an image which is very different than the ones that we uh, complain about, okay? So in how we treat our minorities, in how we, uh, how politics in Pakistan ought to become less divisive. But there are some big takeaways on what Pakistan has done right. And to me, one of the biggest one is that in all of this fractured sort of politics around our, in our neighborhood, Pakistan and whatever economic impact we were having within uh, Pakistan, and right now we also have an oil impact, by the way, which is coming out of the Ukrainian crisis, which is turning into a fiscal crisis. Mm. So who would have thought that the conflict in Ukraine would have a direct impact on fiscal space in Pakistan? But despite that, uh, 10 years back, <clears throat> when we were in government earlier, and then all successive governments, which is actually a very big indication of positivity to me, decided to take it along, is that we decided to create a highway for the poor in Pakistan, where we said, okay, beyond a certain limit, everybody has to be supported through this thing called the Basic Income Support Program, which was targeting, by the way, women. So it said that the household receivers will be women so that their status in the household is also improved. Mm -hmm. So it turned out to be a very innovative and far-reaching and has a far-reaching impact. And now we have built-in health insurance and many other, used it really as a platform as a, and as a highway. So that when the Pakistani economy suffers from the shocks that it suffers, the poor are at least given a certain, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, a certain income that will go to their homes. A floor. A floor in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I am, I'm just going to perhaps leave you with this thought that <clears throat> South Asia happens to be a region which has benefited the least from being in the, being in its geography, which means that even the countries which have done well within South Asia have done it by trading with countries which are far, far away. So the best country performer in South Asia would also have intra-regional trade which is less than 5%, which is not the norm anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just to say that on the trajectory that we thought we were going, with everybody having a reason to normalize, mm. that trajectory has been broken because of the superimposition of the China containment policy. Mm. And giving others a reason to now be sort of divided rather than together. Mm. So that to me is a very, very big challenge uh, as we go forward because I genuinely believe that if this region can't come together and uh, be able to live, uh, you know, trade, invest in each other, have people-to-people -people contacts, et cetera, we will be held back by our geography and by our history. We want to be, we want to be able to break free from both, uh, not, not a geography, obviously, mm. but from a bad past, so to speak. Mm. Thank you. Carolyn, any reflections on what we're hearing from these two very different national contexts? You know, I think, I think they're talking about, as policymakers, how many issues they have to deal with. Mm. We tend to think, um, since we're not in government, that government deals with one mm -hmm. issue at a time, mm -hmm. but all the issues come together. And I think, I think um, as I say, two, three years ago, there was a much more singular focus Absolutely. on how can we build back better, mm -hmm. uh, how can we deal with climate change, and now there are all these things coming in mm -hmm. from left and right, politics, economics, culture. Um, I do see some positive things, though. Uh, greening of the supply chain. Companies are beginning to talk about that. There's, there's greenwashing, we know, but um, there's also, I think, a sincere effort to try and look at that supply chain. I would like to see it be not just about the greening, but also taking responsibility for the health of people along your supply chain. Uh, putting the S really in ESG, so it's not, mm. the focus isn't all just on environment and governance, mm. but also on social. Um, we do a lot of work um, with artisanal miners who are mining cobalt or mica or many of the products we all use now in batteries and in our cell phones. Um, 
they are really uh, a forgotten workforce. And we love to talk in development about the last mile, about getting vaccines to the last mile, which means the communities. But really, these people are the first mile. They are the first mile on a supply chain that gives all of us what we need to live our lives. And we need to recognize uh, their role and our dependence on them and begin to work with those communities. We need to certify these products. We need to trace their, their cradle to grave um, journey into our stores so that ultimately we know where was their child labor? Uh, were people, pro did they have access to health care? What were the health and safety around the production? So I think that's, um, that's also positive, but we have to build on it and we have to hold companies accountable. I'm, I'm a little worried in this trust issue. Uh, we know that the polls say people don't trust government, but people have trusted business a little bit more. Yesterday, I was at a lunch with um, corporate CEOs, and it became clear that despite all the talk about progress on net zero, that 2030 may come and not a lot will have been done. Mm -hmm. And then I think disillusion will set in. Mm. And then you have to ask, well, who are people going to trust then? Mm. And are we going to have a backlash? Mm -hmm. and, and finally, I would say that Davos was really one of the homes of globalization yes. 1.0. Mm. And now people are talking about deglobalization. Absolutely. And where I think globalization 1.0 went wrong was it didn't bring populations with it. We know people lost out. We know that people didn't get the education to retrain them for mm. different jobs. We know that whole communities got left behind. As we go to deglobalization 2.0, it's imperative that leaders bring their publics with them. We have to, politicians, I, I can say because I'm not one, but have to win the politics of progress. And sometimes we feel that a lot of politicians <coughs> look to blame what's happening external forces, and there's no question they're very tough but it's also about healing inside and uniting your population. So when I hear deglobalization, I, I, I think we need to know what that means. Are suddenly people who've been producing in, um, in developing economies and emerging economies gonna be now discarded because people, companies are bringing their supply chains home when a lot of corporates talk about localization, they don't mean communities in emerging markets or developing, they mean bringing them home to their own countries, which has benefits, but it threatens leaving an awful lot of people behind. So let's have a debate of what that deglobalized world <coughs> might look like, and um, let's be very clear who are gonna be the winners and losers, and if there are losers, how are we going to support them? Yeah, good question. Audience, now is your hour. <laughs> Would anyone like to uh, to come in with any any reflections or, or thoughts? I, I did mention Myanmar in passing, and I'm very conscious we have the UN Special Envoy for Myanmar, Noli, in a, a, a crisis which isn't in our headlines. But, if, I mean, you're a very experienced, long-time international public servant, any reflections you'd like to make about how we get, get back on course and try and rise above these challenges? Sorry, I came in late, uh, but I was very interested in this whole uh, issue of localization. Mm. Because I think at the end of the day, because there's a collapse of trust mm. in so many uh, institutions, I think the new politics and the new empowerment and the agency and the dreaming, uh, in a sense, will have to come from the local uh, in, in a way that uh, it will allow uh, what people feel are, are the main challenges, but then we have to um, amplify it. So it can't just be the local, mm -hmm. because it, the local has got to be supported mm -hmm. by the national, by the regional. So in a sense, it is really getting that energy mm -hmm 
but supported. So if you can't leave the local alone and hope to just give them a bit of aid here and there. It has to be supported by good systems, good infrastructure, the, where the investment goes, and what the new business model could look like mm. if people are to be supported. Mm. And, and what do they want to be supported? It's actually a future for their children. Mm. Uh, we cannot leave mm. a future so devastated Mm -hmm. and hope that, uh, uh, that we can create stability and sustainability without creating that. I'm not even coming to the conflicts mm. and why mm. there's such a lot of conflicts and where even what I say uh, in this country that I'm <coughs> supposed to be to ha be helping when I talk about social transformation, the people said, no, we want a revolution. We need a revolution. And what they mean is a total re-throwing mm. out of what governance should mm -hmm. look like. So it's not just the ESG, uh, uh, but, but really how on earth do you root humanity at the center of the governance system and the politics that we have. Mm. Just a, a quick thought in the midst of dealing with conflicts of the worst kind. <laughs> a good Thank thought, you, a very good thought, <laughs> not just a quick thought. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyone else like to, to come back uh, to the panel with, uh, with thoughts? Yes, uh, in the front and then behind you. Hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm a global shaper from Seychelles. Um, we started by saying it probably it was more of the more pessimistic um, challenges in terms of taking on. But actually, out of a lot of the panels I've listened to, I think this was the most um, optimistic approach to these very real, very big challenges. And coming from a small island state where you know dealing with climate crisis, it's not always possible to have that shine, that light shines and on, on on your problems. But what I really appreciated was the talk around re regional integration. It seems like when um, the old age adage of when it's tough, the tough get going, but mm -hmm. I think the smart actually get together and mm -hmm. figure things out. And I see a lot of that happening. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of history uh, to get over a lot of geography and geopolitics, I think, that are very, um, not just in Europe, across the world. But I think the trick is, is this approach. So I'm really glad to see that because I think that's that's key. So that's just one reflection I'd like to make. Well, I think as a panel, we feel proud that we've turned we this pressing outlook into well, something where we can indeed. innovate and move forward. Absolutely. So thank you for that. Just behind you, I think there was a hand up. Maybe, maybe not. Around here. Yep. Hi, I'm Sarah Pantuliano from ODI. Um, hi. Um, great reflections. One thing I have perhaps not heard as much, and it's something I'm you know, sort of thinking about all the time, is actually how the multilateral system has really struggled mm -hmm. to you know, come to the fore and really uh, be seen to deliver during the pandemic. In many ways, mm -hmm. we've seen you know, a bit of a failure of the multilateral system, be that in terms of the delivery or in terms of the financing that has not been made available mm -hmm. you know, to, to those that needed it. I mean, you know, if you look about the incredible level of fiscal stimulus we have seen in rich countries, you know, what has actually been um, put made, made available in terms of you know, resources for low and middle income countries is like 0.05%. I think we were mm -hmm. estimated to the I I mean, it's incredible. Now, what, building on Nolene's um, comment, one thing I've, you know, obviously going forward, we're going to struggle even more in terms of making the multilateral system work because of the paralysis <coughs> that we see, um, given to you know the, the, the spillover of the crisis in Ukraine. And something that I've been reflecting a lot um, uh, with colleagues at ODI is that perhaps we need to enter a, a different phase where rather than the traditional multilateral system, we really try and bring that back to its normative, you know, the standard setting, um, if you want, the function that it has. But for delivery, for, you know, for really to advance uh, progress, we need to turn to coalitions of like-minded actors that bring together governments, civil society, businesses, mm -hmm. um, you know, with shared goals and very sort of specific objectives that they, you know, they want to achieve. And we've seen that very well in the climate space where, you know, these coalitions are sort of coming together. We've seen them on, you know, the Vaccine Alliance, Gabi, there are, there are examples. But I'd be interested in your reflections because I think, I think we need to, to have a quantum leap and move away from the traditional sort of multilateral mm. system as we've seen it so far. Mm. Yeah, very, very, very good question. I, I see our clock ticking, so I'm going to come back to the panel and say, um, any, any reflections on the points that have been, that have been raised? Uh, Nolene talking about the, the new model. You're talking about new <laughs> models, Sarah. And 
Thank you for your optimistic comments. But uh, you know, can we rise to the challenge as, as a world to move in directions that are more productive coming out of this? I really like the comments that I just heard. So if we can say globalization 1.0 was actually um, global competition. Mm. And in global competition, how it works is that you have local know-hows and then you try to sell to everybody in every other place. Uh, so in this globalization, it's more about competitive access of markets, which seem to have solved some problems but created others. What I think you all are referring to is globalization 2.0 is coordinated problem solving, which is very different than uh, just global competition. If we can do a coordinated problem solving, then we become more powerful, stronger, the synergies are assessed. And that's a very different approach than globalization 1.0. Yeah. So I think uh, localization is not the opposite of globalization, but it's local problem, so problem solving in a coordinated global way. I think that that's the, the the direction forward, at least from my Fantastic. point of view. Yeah. Minister? Okay, I'm going to try and weave this together and let's see if I can, because I was particularly enamored by a comment that you made uh, pertaining to coming to Davos and not seeing the word sustainable anywhere, right? And that is what I generally feel that has happened in the last two years, that global goods are no more on the agenda uh, as an active mission. And I also want to uh, sort of weave this together to say that there are two things. One is deglobalization which is a good thing, but needs to be managed uh, in a way that it doesn't break anything. And you know, there's a localization, but then the global goods remain the global goods and the global infrastructure remain the global infrastructure and the global systems remain global systems. And then there is the more uh, challenging or uh, difficult decoupling. There's a difference between deglobalization and decoupling. Deglobalization, good thing, decoupling, bad thing. Mm -hmm. If decoupling that we see this charge towards decoupling continues in the world system, then I fear, and I hope I'm not being overly pessimistic, but I truly fear the worst because I think exactly what you're saying, sustainable uh, SDGs, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, climate change, which affects all of humanity are going to get off the agenda and off the radar screen. And I, when, when, when we sit here in this time, I like to imagine, are we, what we're experiencing, is this a blip, is this a turning point, is this an inflection point? Because when history is written, really, you know, we've already forgotten Afghanistan, we will soon forget Ukraine, perhaps, and then we'll go on to the next big challenge. And then, you know, for the next two weeks, be really obsessed with it, and then we'll move on. But we, what we leave behind is real people, and real impact, and real ramifications, and repercussions, not only for the people, but for the geography, for the region. So, uh, in, in some ways, trying to weave this together, uh, there is a role that the multilateral systems have until the time that we have not come up with a better system It's, it's the only guarantee of security that is given to smaller states and medium-sized states and when everybody starts Looking for exceptions Because they are able to justify their behavior because they are means to good ends and everybody else's behavior is means to bad ends It creates a problematic situation and that is what we're seeing right now so because then you go Ex against international law to do something because you think it's the right thing to do, but then when someone else does it, it's the wrong thing to do. That's a bit problematic. So I'm just going to perhaps weave this together and give the, uh, maybe part of the problem. A little time, we've only of got course. one minute left. <laughs> I have one yes. sentence. Yes. Just, just last thing, that the global agenda setting yes. has been this affair of the developed world. Mm. I think the challenge is that the developing world is saying, we have the ability to set the agenda where is our share of having a voice in that global agenda setting? Carolyn, you're so watching that clock. <laughs> I will just say on the multilateral system, it's going to be harder because it's now divided and, and not everybody's on the mm. same page. We've got big countries mm. that are, uh, are not together. On the multilateral financial system, I think we really have to ask, are our institutions fit for purpose? They are not taking the degree of risk. They're meant to go in and invest when no one else will. They, they're too mm. much a status quo issue now. Indeed. They have to have new instruments around debt. They have to be much more forward looking. Let's, let's look at a new multilateral financial system for a globalization 2.0. And I think 
we can bring it all together in a way that is positive. Fantastic, and I think taking out of it, the themes that really came through were localization, the need for regionalization as we look for solutions, energy transition, got a good uh, plug uh, as well, uh, the human dimensions of, of globalization, which were overlooked and need to be you know, built back into the, the paradigm, and then your new era 2.0 of coordinated uh, public policy uh, approaches. So great panel, please join me in giving them a hand. Thank you.